<clears throat> so today, um, our topic is uh, interactive best practices, job management and scheduling. I'm Catherine Lawrence. I work for the Science Gateways Community Institute, and I'll be the moderator today. Um, but we're going to have presentations, three presentations today, by Todd Tannenbaum of the HT Condor Project. Uh, he also works with Marone Livney, who I uh, see is also on the call and, and may answer questions. Uh, we have Mark Miller from the Cypress Gateway and, and Sudakar uh, Pamadigandam, I I don't know if I got that right, uh, from the Seagrid Project. And so they, uh, that is also a gateway. Um, so we're going to begin with Todd, uh, who will um, spend 10 or 15 minutes talking about how he runs jobs. And then um, from there, we will um, switch to each of the other presenters and have time for questions uh, to the whole group at the end. Um, <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let Todd take over. All right, let's see if I can get this to work. Share. Yep. All right, oh, people, we see, people we see, see your the, screen. Yes, see the thank screen you. of full size there? Okay. Yep, it looks great. All right, so uh, thank you very much uh, for allowing me to speak today. And I am going to uh, talk about uh, in empowering job management uh, in Science Gateways with HT Condor. So uh, I work here at the University of Wisconsin in the Department of Computer Science, uh, specifically in the Center for High Throughput Computing. And uh, our center is dedicated to uh, uh, enabling scientific discovery uh, uh, by leveraging high throughput computing. And one activity we have in the center is creating and maintaining HT Condor, which is open source distributed high throughput computing software. Uh, the idea is you can submit your jobs to HT Condor and HT Condor will sc schedule, provision your job, uh, manage compute resources such as uh, execute nodes, um, It'll also uh, can run containers such as you know schedule and manage Docker containers or Singularity containers, uh, and manage your jobs, including workflows. And as I said, the the primary objective uh, for HD Condor is to assist the scientific community with their computing needs. Uh, HD Condor is mature technology. We've been uh, around for about 20 years, uh, but it is actively developed. Uh, we make regular releases. We average probably about 10 or 12 releases uh, per year. Uh, we have a stable series that receives bug fixes only. And then we also, in parallel, develop a new features series. And then about once a year, the, the new feature series becomes the stable series. It's an open development model. And uh, we evolve the software to meet the needs of the scientific community. And a graph here showing, you know, in a, in a year period, we had, you know, a couple dozen contributors and thousands of commits, and uh, it is active. So why am I presenting today? Uh, our goal uh, is to enable folks who work on science gateways to focus on the interaction of the science and the scientists and not, you know, necessarily have to worry about job provisioning, resource provisioning, job scheduling, and workflow management. Um, you know, this work, we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, why reinvent the wheel? Uh, please feel free to leverage what we've done. And uh, there are many organizations that have uh, indeed built science gateways on top of HT Condor, including the LHC uh, Collider, the CMS detector, uh, makes heavy use of, of HT Condor. Uh, Pegasus, I saw Matt's is, uh, is online. Uh, he uses that. Uh, BMRB, NEOS, Leica, uh, commercial organizations like DreamWorks uh, have built gateways on top of HD Condor, the Hubble Telescope Operations, uh, National uh, NOAA Atmospheric and Oceanography uh, Administration. Um, so HD Condor has been designed not only for use by end user humans, but it also has been designed uh, with the use of, of software such as gateways sitting on top of it uh, in mind. So uh, Facebook is full of memes. This is a this is a meme I found on Facebook a, a while back. Maybe uh, I'll let you I'll let you think about that. But uh, uh, three things you should know about HD Condor. 
if you work on science gateways. So uh, takeaway item number one, uh, HT Condor embodies the principle of submit local and run global. And what do I mean by this? Well, uh, first off, HT Condor is designed a little differently than your typical job uh, scheduler. Um, HT Condor does not require a, a shared file system, for instance. So, so think about if you have a, your jobs all submitted at your local institution, perhaps by your, by your gateway, what prevents you uh, from using some, some server to execute the jobs? Imagine I call you up on the phone and I say, hey, I have a server available, uh, I, I'll let you use it. What are reasons that a typical scheduler perhaps couldn't make use of it? Well, you know, one reason is, is a big one is a shared file system. Uh, my server probably doesn't have an NFS shared mount with your gateway uh, uh, server. Um, HD Condor does not require a shared file system. It can transfer the files from your local environment where your gateway is running to the execute node and then transfer the result files back. Uh, another reason uh, that typically prevents you from using my machine is, well, there's a bunch of services that need to be installed by root and they need to run as root. So HD Condor does not require root access to run. Uh, and so it can be installed and uh, dynamically on the fly, which is useful. And we're gonna learn why later. Uh, it doesn't, re HD Condor doesn't require a unified user login space between the submit machine and the execute nodes. So on the execute nodes, it can run as a Condor run account. Uh, it, it doesn't require all the users to have separate accounts. Uh, Condor does not require full network communication uh, between nodes. Uh, the execute nodes only need to have outgoing network communication, which is typical if the execute nodes are behind a NAT or a firewall. No incoming communication is required. Um, and HD Condor does not assume that you have a static set or even a reliable set of compute servers. HD Condor can deal with uh, compute machines dynamically appearing on the fly and dynamically just disappearing. Uh, and it'll retry your job if, if a job gets lost and it, and it understands all that. So the result is once a job is submitted in HD Condor, it can run almost anywhere. So by submit local, the idea is you have your science gateway software. It turns around and submits jobs or workflows into HD Condor. And once your job is in HD Condor, uh, there's lots of places that HD Condor could turn around and run it. So you could run, obviously, on a, on a local HD Condor cluster that might be a, a part of your, your gateway. Uh, perhaps you have friends with HD Condor clusters, and it's very easy for HD Condor to send your jobs to remote HD Condor installations. In addition, uh, maybe at your institution you have other clusters on your campus or access to other clusters, such as a, a Slurm PBS or a Grid Engine cluster. HD Condor, by just using a, a login on the head node, can send jobs that your gateway submits in and can delegate them off to run on these other systems and monitor their progress and, and manage them and send all the, the results back. HD Condor also can easily send out to the Open Science Grid, which is funded by the National Science Foundation and has a, about 100 120 or so sites throughout the US uh, where you can use computing resources at other institutions. Uh, similarly, HD Condor can submit into a growing number of Exceed uh, compute resources. And it's also, uh, HD Condor is rapidly gaining capabilities to grow uh, your cluster and run your jobs in public clouds, such as Amazon, uh, AWS. And uh, we have a tool that will just dynamically grow your cluster into EC2. So you can run there as well. So let's talk about uh, the submission of jobs or workflows just, just briefly. So to submit a job, you can submit a single batch job or an interactive job, or you can submit a bag of jobs, or you can easily submit an entire workflow. Well, oh, sorry. How do we go backwards? There we go. Uh, you can, or you can submit an entire workflow of jobs, which is multiple jobs that have interdependencies. And you can do this via command line tools, 
and the command line tools are designed to be easily uh, called out from shell scripts. Or uh, we have a Python uh, API. And so there's an HD Condor Python module. So if your gateway is written in Python, this is a very nice option. Uh, to submit a job, you, you create a submit file or you do call invoke Python methods to specify what resources are required by the job, what files to transfer, if you want Condor to move files around in, in absence of a shared file system. Uh, you can specify that the identity of the submitting user and or submitting user group. You can specify a retry policy for jobs. If they fail, how many times do you want it to automatically retry? There's lots and lots of, uh, of options. But part of our goal was to make simple things simple and more complicated things possible. Uh, once your job is submitted, you can monitor the progress of your job by command line tools. And again, they're designed to be able to be used from a, a, a scripting environment. So you don't have to do any kind of screen scraping or anything like this, uh, or from the Python module. Uh, when you submit your job, even if it's running remotely on, uh, I'll say, on, in the Open Science Grid, you can still stream uh, the standard out and standard air from your job back. That can give you progress information. Condor can make a job event log, which is just a text file that's easily human readable or machine readable that gives a, an entry in this log, just appends to this log whenever anything interesting happens to your job, like it starts running or it gets killed or it restarts somewhere else, um, an event is written. There's also a nifty tool called Condor SSH to job, which will give you an interactive shell prompt um, within the environment where your job is running. And this is very nifty to allow uh, someone to, to go to where their job is running and observe how it's running and look at files as they're created. And no SSH access is required to the machine itself. Because again, you don't even need to have a login on the machine where the, where the node is running. And that's a, a, a popular feature. So here's a quick example of a, of a simple job submit. Uh, you create a file that, in this example called job submit, that says the name of the program to run, any command line arguments, maybe some files to be transferred as input, the file that should contain your event log, and then you queue it up and you run counter submit and it's submitted. Uh, here's an example of submitting a bag of jobs. And this is popular for like a, a parameter, uh, you know, a parameter space or a Monte Carlo flow, where you have the same executable and you have hundreds of different input data sets that you want to run. So in this example, I'm, I'm putting different input data sets in a series of subdirectories called job zero through job 500. And I can just do Q500 to submit all 500 runs at once. And I'm saying, well, the initial working directory for each job should be based on this proc ID macro, which will increment from zero to 500 as the jobs run. So I mentioned that uh, you can submit workflows as well. A workflow is a series of jobs that have parent-child relationships. So there's interdependencies between the jobs. So in this simple workflow here, we're saying, well, Condor, first run job A. When job A is done, then submit at the same time jobs B1 through Bn. And then when all of these complete, I want you to run job C. And uh, specifying uh, a workflow or, or a DAG directed acyclic graph is pretty simple in Condor. It's just a, a human readable ASCII file. We have users here at CHTC that aren't even that comfortable with the command line that after a, you know after a day or two, they're able to, to create their own workflow DAG files. And basically you just specify all the, the jobs and which submit file uh, contains the information on how to run the job. And then you give these parent and child uh, relationship statements where I'm saying, well, Parent A, job A, has all these children, and, and this guy here, child C, is, has uh, B1 through N as parents. And at that point, uh, HT Condor would run the workflow. Um, other options you can put in here is you can have pre and post scripts before every node. Each node can have retry properties. Uh, there's a lot of uh, flexibility. Once you uh, specify your DAG, you just submit it with the command line tool, Condor Submit DAG, 
or you could use uh, the Python interface. So takeaway item number two, uh, you can leverage the fact that HT Condor uh, is also a NoSQL database. And what do I mean by this? Well, there's always kind of a, a, a challenge uh, with science gateways submitting jobs into a, a scheduler or workflow manager. Where typically the science gateway has a database itself, and this database is going to contain information about the task at hand uh, that's happening in the, the, the gateway, such as you know maybe uh, something specific to the science. Maybe the gateway needs to know that this work is associated with DNA sequence number X, and the organization is the Mayo Clinic. And then it turns around and wants to submit this to the scheduler. And typically a gateway is going to have to submit it in and get some kind of job ID back. And then it's going to have to use that job ID as a database primary key and insert back into its database the, the, the job ID that it got from the scheduler. And keeping these two databases between the gateway and the scheduler in sync is a non-trivial uh, operation especially if you consider uh, machine restarts and machine crashes and uh, uh, large numbers of jobs. Uh, I have a very nice thick book on my bookshelf uh, uh, talking about you know, Paxos algorithm and two-phase commit. And uh, Jim Gray, I think, uh, wrote a lot of books on this topic. Uh, this is a, this is a non-trivial task. However, when you submit into HT Condor, uh, obviously it has a database to keep track of jobs. Uh, this database is atomic, and it is uh, uh, it's, it's essentially fully it's fully transactional, uh, and it's durable. So that if you restart, for instance, the node that is running HT Condor, uh, HT Condor will come back and reconnect to all the execute nodes it was using and kind of continue right where it left off. Uh, this database is NoSQL, meaning you can insert arbitrary attributes into the records associated with every job. And this is nice because then instead of going through the complication of having your gateway submit to HT Condor and got to put, you know, two-phase commit, put the scheduler job ID back in, you could just submit to Condor and in your submit file, you can say, oh, when you associated with this, I want this gateway task ID to go in. Um, or you could go one step further. And we've had people do this where they feasibly just don't even bother to have a database as part of the science gateway, which eliminates you know, an entire, uh, I don't know why it skipped. Here we go. Uh, eliminates an entire layer of software. Maybe now your gateway doesn't have to deal with Postgres and, and everything else. And what you can do is just put these attributes right into the job that your gateway needs. And with HD Condor, you can query on these. It's very easy to say, give me all the jobs where the DNA sequence number is X. Or you can say, remove all the jobs where the organization is Mayo Clinic. Um, so that's a, that's a handy thing. It avoids a lot of work. Uh, a last takeaway I just want to leave with you is we've already done a lot of work to handle job management uh, for you. And what do I mean by for you? And uh, I mean, it really is for you. It is for the scientific community. Uh, HT Condor is open source, uh, funded primarily by NSF, and it developed within a university computing center. Uh, we aren't a company, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're not out to make money. Uh, I don't get a commission for every person that decides to use HD Condor. Uh, our entire uh, mission is to help the science community with computing. Um, and we've been at it a long time. Uh, there are many options for support. There's a very active uh, community uh, support email list. Uh, you can purchase a higher le level of support if you want. Um, if you give HT Condor your jobs or your workflow, there's many ways we can schedule and monitor it. And if HT Condor doesn't already do something that your gateway requires, uh, we can talk about it. Because again, our goal is to make your life easier. Helping the scientific community is our primary focus. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll conclude and take a couple questions. 
Yeah, we have we haven't had any questions come in through chat while you were presenting, um, uh, but we could take a, one. Okay, is that Mona? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Mona. Um, I have a question. So you uh, mentioned that the Science Gateway can store information in the HT Condor database. How Correct. long does that information stay? Uh, the information uh, stays as long as the uh, the job is in the queue. When the job leaves the queue, because say it was uh, removed or or completed, um, then HT Condor moves it into a, a separate file called the the history file, which contains all the attributes about the job, including the custom attributes that that your gateway may have added. And how would the gateway be able to access that information? There is a command line tool or Python bindings to access that as well. But uh, uh, this is me on. Uh, let me also add that uh, we did some work on ingesting the output of, of you know, these records into uh, SQL databases, I mean, non-SQL databases. And uh, that's something that we can work on if you want to have all this organized in a database for future reference. Yeah, that goes right. beyond the the command line tool. Yeah, that is true. So, we we have sites that take these uh, these history job records, if you will, and and push them. And we're doing that this here as well. We and push them into things like Elasticsearch. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question, Mona. Um, how about we switch uh, uh, now to Mark Miller, and um, if you can unshare your screen, Todd, um, we'll also have time at the end, um, provided uh, our presenters are efficient, um, to ask questions to the whole group. Okay. So, um, yeah, just, how, do I, um, how do I unshare? <laughs> uh, th there should be um, something that pops up near the bottom oh. that says stop sharing. Stop sharing. Got it. There you go. So you can go ahead, Mark, and share your screen. So our next our next presenter is Mark Miller, who is affiliated with the San Diego Supercomputer Center and is the creator of the Cypress Gateway. Oh boy, uh, can you hear me? Are you getting arrested, Mark? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh, they found me. Um, hold on a second, something's going wrong here. Oh, Mark, I'll also give you a heads up when you're getting close to the end of your 15 minutes, just so you know. Thanks. So, yeah. Okay, let's see if that works. Are you seeing my screen? We are. <laughs> Oh, good. I'm not. Okay. Let me, uh... You just need to start okay. your slides, that's all. There okay. you go. It looks good. All right. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, given the shortness of the time, um, I wanted to give people a brief overview of, of how Cypress uh, manages its jobs and a little bit about our use case in the hopes of really just establishing me as a contact or a resource for people who are building gateways rather than to think I could answer, you know, a lot of detailed questions at this point. So uh, Cypress is a classic um, browser-based gateway um, designed to submit jobs to multiple hosts. So we serve the phylogenetics community and, uh, you know, things mostly happen through a browser interface. We have REST services now as well. And the idea is to route the jobs to the appropriate resource, be it serial here locally at SDSC or on Exceed when we run parallel codes. And, and our basic use case looks something like this. We're getting about 25,000 submissions a month right now. Um, some of those require long times, up to 168 hours is our current maximum. Uh, and that's driven by the fact that many of our codes have no restart ability, although some do. Um, scalability on our code, uh, on co this, these community codes is not strong. Um, they go up to 60, 64 cores, something like that, before they become inefficient. Um, 
our data sets are small, so uploads are fairly non-heroic. You know, we're one to 50 me um, megabyte files. Um, and many community codes are available, more than we can implement with the little team that we have. And our users are relatively unsophisticated from the HPC point of view. They don't know a ton about how many how many um, threads to use or how many cores to use even. So we do that behind the scenes for them. And, uh, and right now we have a really small staff. We have less than two FDEs and we've run that way pretty much forever. Um, so as I mentioned, your use case is gonna be different. Um, each use case is its own thing. Um, we've used this software that underlies Cypress for three other gateways uh, currently and, um, and it's, it's adaptable and it's uh, mature. Um, so uh, the basic operating procedures for our software, um, the web application, the users interact with web forms and configure their jobs by, by, uh, by entering values into a web form. Behind the scenes, uh, the jobs are configured, as I mentioned, based on user input. We don't let the users do a lot of configuration. Um, that happens automatically behind the scenes. Um, then the submissions are validated. They're entered into a, into a running jobs database for tracking purposes. And then they're submitted uh, to a remote uh, execution host, which is variable. It's designed to, to accept many different possible hosts. Um, and when job status changes, the user receives notifications. In the end. So that, I mean, that's the basic overview. And, and as we launched and started to get submissions, um, we started with a set of questions. And the main one was, you know, why do job submissions fail? And when do we care? When does it matter? And what parts can we control and what parts are outside of our control? Because we're a tiny resourced uh, group, we had pretty, pretty strict attention to, to prioritizing things that really mattered. Um, in terms of our viability and in terms of users. So um, if we, when we first looked at this, our success rate was about 60%. And breaking down the errors that we could see, the, the, by far the, the majority of errors uh, were user input errors, which means users are submitting jobs with input files that are um, not, their formats incorrect or there's an incorrect command. Um, and below that, we have machine, I call it, or system error, uh, and then communication errors, which are when our application lost, lost communication with, uh, with the remote resource for whatever reason. And then there are a few errors that are unknown. So this is old data, but this is where we started. And the way we approach it is just do error impact. You know, what do we have to fix? Because we can only fix things you know, in a certain order with a certain number of resources. So, and, and pretty clearly, although not the most common error, communication errors are errors where what happened the way it, with our initial architecture was that if we lost communication with the host, the execution host, um, the job would continue running, the user would lose track of their job, and then they would either contact us or not. So we're running a lot of uh, jobs that are getting lost and um, not having any impact whatsoever. So that's where we started. And so we created a system based on demons uh, to make that robust. And um, what we created here then is a submission daemon, which uh, once, once a job is submitted and enters the database, because it's validated, um, the, the submission daemon authenticates, creates a working directory, uh, places the input files in there, and then it, it interacts with the script on the host uh, to create uh, and submit the job. And so each execution host uh, has its own custom script. Uh, that's part of what makes it a little awkward to shift between hosts, but that's, that's the architecture we're using now. Um, and then once the job is completed, there is a result uh, retrieval daemon that that communicates again with a custom script on the host to, to, to find the completed tasks and transfer the results and then remove the job and mark it as done in, in the running task table. And as long as it's not marked done, um, the daemon will continue to look for this job. And if 
if the tr results transfer fails, it'll be retried multiple times before it gives up. So that's how we address that first issue. And then of the other issues that we found, um, user errors um, are interesting. About 20% of the jobs right now are failing immediately because of user error. And, and the percent of success uh, on any given code depends on how the input files are created. If there's a software package, an auxiliary package that the user can use to create their input, the success rate uh, is high. And if they're able to edit and create it by themselves, it's low. And that's not too surprising. It's an error-prone process. Um, uh, but that's something to note. Um, and then, could we help users detect errors before submission? and suggest corrections. Yes, we can do that. And it wasn't the first priority because if you look at the cost to us, it's zero, except for the fact that people report them and ask for help, and that takes some of my time, and we estimate the cost of that to be at 50 or 20, 15 to $20,000 per year. So that sort of puts it on the priority um, below some of the other issues, but it's an important one if we can help. Um, Similarly, system errors, um, three to four percent of our jobs, if you just look at how many jobs failed versus how many were submitted, it shows up as three to four percent. Um, Ninety-eight percent of that occurs in what I decided to call crisis islands. It means like the scheduler is down for everyone and every submission is failing and users resubmit and resubmit. They don't necessarily contact me to tell me it's not working, but they'll just resubmit because that's just the user behavior. So that, that bloats the number of failures we appear to have because it's like one downtime can generate lots and lots of failures. Um, but there isn't a lot we can do here to help. And then like about 2%, maybe 100 jobs a year are failing due to uh, sporadic scheduler unavailability. For some reason, the scheduler wasn't happy at the moment it was contacted or um, uh, the database wasn't, wasn't in, in in sync for a moment, and so that job will fail. And uh, so it's a small number, but but retrying is certain would certainly be useful. But how much do we want to invest in it? The two percent versus ninety eight percent, one hundred jobs a year. Not sure. So that's just sort of our, how we think about it. Um, and if you look at the kinds of system errors we encountered, uh, we, we encountered. Um, this is a what I've found. Sometimes there's an expired or unavailable allocation, and, and um, there can be a bug in the Cypress interface that causes a configuration that um, the, the scheduler doesn't recognize and it will reject it. And then the other one's um, emergency maintenance. Um, the scheduler's just down, the system's uh, down, um, or something unexpected is happening between Cypress and the infrastructure that's not well defined. And, and of those, uh, we have probably two of them that we can address. Uh, we can make uh, the handling of expired allocations more elegant, for sure. That's not the hugest problem. Um, the bugs we address as they arise, there's, you know, bugs are bugs. You find them when you find them or when someone reports them. Um, and the others are sort of out of our control and we really can't sink resources into them. There's not a lot we can do about them. Those things are just going to happen. Um, and talk about features that we've added, you know, just lessons learned. Um, the ability to halt submissions from a given user account um, because uh, they're abusing or they've overspent because they are limited in terms of how much time they can use. Um, and uh, the ability to, to monitor usage by each account automatically, of course, that's part of our tracking. And then it, we found it was extremely important to give users the ability to track their own consumption because they can't be strategic if they don't know what's going on. So we give them tools to see how much they've used, forecast how much the next job's going to take, and uh, we give them tools to kill a job in case they didn't like the one they deployed. Um, okay, so, and then the ability to charge to a personal allocation should they receive one from Exceed if they go beyond what they can take from the Cypress community account. Um, and the last thing is notification of job failures um, mailed to us uh, because users don't report them. It's amazing. It's like less than 1% of all job failures are reported in the form of a bug report or a complaint. So it's really helpful to have notification when things go bad. And as we're uh, more mature, we start to ask a slightly different kind of question. 
Um, we're asking how can we ensure job runs are configured correctly, for example. Right now we rely on the users to enter correct information. Of course, that's not always the case. And in fact, it's not the case more than we, we thought it was after we did some studies of that. So, so um, instead of letting the user say what's in their data set, um, we need tools to, we'd like to have tools that would look into the data set and extract those values and configure the job without the user participation. Um, detecting wasteful jobs more quickly, it's like if, if there's a bug in an interface, this has happened a couple of times where there will be a hole in the interface where the jobs will come out configured badly and wastefully, and it takes us a little while to find them. Um, so uh, a automate, more automated way of doing that. And the last thing is, what does it mean when there are no submissions? And, and what I mean by that is users create accounts or get guest accounts which never submit a job. And the question that leaves us with is, is our usability really awful? You know, are they having trouble finding it or are they just unmotivated? And what kind of resources do we sink into solving that problem? So that's an ongoing question for us right now. And to conclude, um, here are some things we've added, uh, that, uh, sorry, that we'd like to add. Um, streamlined ability to, uh, to deploy on new hosts, which uh, in Condor would be a nice, uh, has solved that problem. Um, we have uh, more difficulty. We have to do some benchmarking to make sure the runs are efficient and each host is a bit different. So, um, so there's that. Um, letting, but that would open the gateway towards a uh, user determining where a job is submitted, if they care, um, or automated software to route the jobs to the host correctly based on the characteristics and availability and take the users out of that equation as well. Um, um, again, I mentioned automated uh, configuration of jobs, so the, so it's based on user data set, not on user input. Um, better tools for job restarting. The, the codes that we have that restart, there's a really ugly way of restarting them, a really fragile way, but they can be done. We'd love to make a better way. So having good restart tools and even codes that don't have restarting, having solving the problem of how to restart things that were stopped prematurely. Um, user-friendly error messaging. How can we decrease the load on us for answering user questions by just giving users, you know, not not bare messages from the scheduler, but something that's a little more user-friendly, so they don't know they they don't think they've made a mistake. They understand here's an issue. Um, uh, we'd like to have uh, tools to gather log data uh, to detect internal failures more quickly and have better statistics on what kinds of failures are occurring right now. It's like parse it out and run it through Excel sheets, it's very manual, so that's not ideal. Um, and I mentioned already job submission and try on failure, which, which would help in a small number of cases for our use case, but for other people that might be a much more important thing. So that's, uh, that's my story. Um, I, I hope that just gives you some sense of what we've encountered and how we've responded and provokes more discussion um, amongst yourselves about what kinds of issues you're running into and, and how they can be solved. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Um, what, I, what I'll suggest is that um, if you unshare your screen wall and let uh, Sudakar get set up, um, then uh, uh, we can take a question if someone has any. Uh, I don't see I don't see any questions in chat. If uh, anybody has any questions, maybe you were just so comprehensive, Mark. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> I understood it all, which says something. <laughs> cool. Thank you. So, all right. Well, then I guess um, we'll just let Sudakar get started. Or Sudakar, sorry. Um, so, can you hear me? I can hear you great. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Okay, I think uh, <clears throat> uh, I'll cover uh, some of the use cases that uh, Secret Gateway has, uh, and I mean, we'll see how far we can go down this uh, outline. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just introduce, and then I'll talk about job types and workflows, how you know preparation, submission, monitoring is done, and I'll briefly talk about restarting and reusing data, you know, in Secret Gateway and uh, sharing and uh, data infrastructure. 
so again, uh, briefly, you know, Seagrid has been uh, in uh, a different form. It used to be called, you know, a computational chemistry grid, um, which we are now in in the, you know, in transition to uh, Seagrid. And the Seagrid has been in in at least in proposals and operation for a couple of years now. The middleware is uh, what is actually transitioning right now. Uh, so just to look at it, you know, we have about 700 users, uh, about 100 or so kind of active. In the last couple of years, we delivered about 56 million SUs. I mean, of course, this is not as as big as uh, Cypress, uh, what Cypress is delivering. So we provided about 65,000 jobs, um, uh, so roughly about you know 30 to 35,000 jobs a year about 45 applications in a couple of years, uh, mainly chemistry applications. I listed the applications here. Uh, though it is uh, chemistry applications, uh, because you know, I'm a chemist and you know, I try to provide to you know, my community, uh, the infrastructure is kind of generic and uh, you know we have some engineering applications also. So that's what the SEA comes up, science and engineering applications. So this uh, gateway provides a desktop client as well as a web-based, browser-based uh, submissions. Uh, in, in the web, uh, in, in the client, we have, you know, uh, in grid cam and uh, the computational chemistry grid, we have included dynamic information services like loads and things like that. Uh, we have checkpoint and reuse, you know, data reuse capabilities. Uh, you know, we, pro we provide both uh, community allocation as well as uh, so uh, individuals who have their own allocation. And of course we do, you know, consulting. So basically, you know, the main aspects are authentication, uh, job composition, input preparation, submission, monitoring, and eventually publication, <clears throat> uh, either for sharing and so on and so forth. So uh, in the last, uh, you know, couple of years, we have been moving towards uh, deploying these things in Airavata. We have uh, now a service available under secret.org, which uses Apache Airavata services. Uh, I'll, I'll show something about Apache Airavata uh, maybe down the line. Um, so this is due to you know uh, making it easy for me to handle uh, different kinds of uh, you know communities that I serve uh, more easily uh, by kind of outsourcing some of the uh, middleware infrastructure uh, issues. Um, of course, you know, Apache, uh, Airavata is an Apache foundation uh, software. It is community driven and uh, and everybody can, you know, uh, come and support it. Um, so input preparation, okay, so in the, in the desktop client uh, views that I'm showing here, we provide, uh, very application or you know domain specific uh, uh, interfaces. Uh, for example, I'm showing here some uh, uh, molecular editors uh, with integrated uh, uh, database uh, based searching and you know extracting data and you know and creating uh, inputs through uh, application specific user interfaces. There are several now available. I mean, this is, I'm just showing one just to indicate that these are available. And this is a, a browser kind of a view where you can just you know upload uh, uh, a file and set up uh, your jobs by setting all the parameters that you need. Uh, as Mark said, you know we eventually want to go to a place where they don't have to set up all these parameters. Now, some of our users are semi-savvy users. They have been using uh, HPC systems, and then they want to make it easy uh, for uh, for them to submit jobs. As you know, systems are evolving rapidly, and uh, things uh, uh, you know become difficult as they have to learn new things each time something changes on the back end. And that and these these things serve those kinds of purposes. Uh, so the experiment status here is uh, some uh, you know status report on the web browser, which is pretty similar to what we have in the in the desktop client as well. Uh, so one thing that I want to focus is in the in the bottom where you know 
they can uh, cancel the job uh, or clone the job or share the uh, job and experiment or the project uh, data uh, you know with other users so those are the kinds of capabilities that are now available uh, in the apache airata frameworks uh, so the apache airata itself uh, you know has a big workflow in uh, task execution uh, I may not be able to go through the, all of these things in the short time I have, but you know, briefly, uh, on the left side it is uh, just a, you know a, a workflow diagram. On the right side it is actually an experiment information that you know both an admin and a user can actually look at in terms of you know a detailed uh, uh, task uh, execution and uh, operation. Uh, so if there is a problem anywhere during these you know task executions, we can quickly locate uh, these things and then uh, troubleshoot for the user and in this particular one is you know completed successfully so there are outputs and standard errors and other uh, outputs logs available for the user to uh, download and extract so yeah, just to uh, briefly describe some of the job I mean, we have uh, serial parallel you know all kinds of parallel kind of uh, applications uh, provided through this uh, uh, gateway. Uh, some of them scale to large number of cores, and some of them are serial. And there are sometimes parameter sweeps, uh, jobs with you know reuse data reuse requirements, and workflows. Uh, in some, uh, there are inherent and you know non-inherent workflows that are. Uh, required by the communities. So this is uh, just to show that there is a way to uh, set up this parameter or sweep type things or you know multiple jobs through some kind of an XML schema where you can define uh, uh, some kind of a name, uh, uh, sorry, a configuration uh, and then uh, and you know, specific different input files and then all of them uh, can be submitted as, as a separate jobs and then run. Uh, so just a couple of one or two uh, points about restarting jobs. I mean, we have uh, two different kinds of restart requirements. Uh, one is this uh, job, uh, I mean, a, a checkpoint file name based restart. Uh, this is uh, a, an input deck from for, for an application called Gaussian, which is uh, an avenue show quantum chemistry application. And the one in the bottom is a quantum espresso application where the restart uh, is not just from one file, but a whole series of files uh, that may be actually buried under multiple directories in, in a job. So uh, we typically use a, a job ID, a reference to extract all the data required for the, the restart. And that's what is actually described here uh, on the left. Um, so, and then of course this requires uh, uh, some kind of you know file and data management and you know data staging based on either just file names or uh, job IDs. So, just you know some uh, brief uh, thing about workflows. Uh, we have implemented several kinds of workflows. I'm showing two workflows here uh, implemented uh, during an Exceed ECSS project for uh, a PI uh, from he was at University of Arkansas at that point, uh, which run which ran uh, lamps based uh, compute systems. Uh, you know there are multiple steps. Some of these some of these ran uh, on different resources. For example, some steps the first one ran on tax stampede. And then eventually we moved to Gordon. Of course, Gordon is now retired. Uh, and in the second workflow in the bottom left, um, most of these are now uh, run on TAC, uh, but the workflow is still there. It, it has components of uh, uh, both computation, computation and uh, visualization. So here is another workflow where uh, you know different kinds of software, again you know spanning multiple. Uh, uh, systems, uh, you know, the Tinker and DFTB both uh, were available at uh, Stampede, and then uh, the Gaussian is available at Comet. And you know, this is what the students did. And on the right, right hand side, bottom, uh, 
the, the results uh, for a, a hydration of calcium carbonate system published in 2015. So there's another workflow uh, uh, which was used for parameterization or parameter optimization for a molecular mechanics parameter set. Uh, I won't go through all these things, but you know this is kind of implemented into an Apache uh, Airavata uh, workflow system. Uh, this view is from a workflow editing slash monitoring uh, framework called XBIA available in Apache Airavata. And so there are basically you know four steps, and I split it into two screens because it was too wide. Uh, so several inputs going into step one, and some of these outputs go into you know, consequent steps, and and these are executed, and they can be monitored using XBI itself, but also a separate uh, text-based uh, monitoring uh, uh, system was implemented uh, for the users to, uh, you know, locate some of these things, and more details about exactly what is happening in the workflow and of course the results uh, if the workflow is completed then automatically uh, the results are plotted uh, in this case uh, it's what's called the validation by the between the quantum mechanical and molecular mechanical systems with uh, and without optimized parameters um, so uh, I, I'm a, uh, this is an engineering uh, application, NEC 5000. Uh, again, you know, I mean, I'm just showing some of the steps in the workflow, including file staging, uh, preparation, you know, compiling the application itself based on some user subroutines, uh, running it in production, preparing, you know, visualization inputs, and you know, generating images and movies, and then, you know, archiving these movies for sharing. In, a, in seedme.org, which is a, uh, a service uh, run by uh, Amit Chaurasia at SDSC for visualizations. And uh, this application is uh, an educational uh, uh, portal where you know, students uh, try to set up parameters and uh, look at how uh, you know, various parameters like um, Reynolds numbers and I mean, other you know spring constants and so on and so forth uh, provide uh, this vortex shedding in, in different models. Yeah, so another uh, workflow is based on quantum espresso, uh, implemented for, for a group uh, at uh, University of Illinois. Uh, you know they work on uh, photonic materials, uh, and they use you know the quantum espresso for quantum mechanical evaluation. And this is just uh, on the right side is some results from their research for cadmium selenide and mercury selenide uh, mixed ternary systems. Um, just briefly to uh, uh, provide uh, some sharing uh, infrastructure available in, in Apache Airavata. So some of the uh, groups you know want to collaborate and share their uh, data with collaborators or you know, publish it you know openly for the whole community to look at. Uh, so there are two different kinds of systems that are available to support that. The the sharing is possible for those people who are already in the gateway, the the users who are registered in the gateway, and the the sharing infrastructure is uh, is embedded into uh, into both the clients, uh, the web browser based and uh, rich client as well. And we can, uh, you know, granularly either share uh, data to uh, just to read or both read and write. Uh, if the write is available, write permission is available, then the collaborators can also change the data and, you know, uh, clone and resubmit jobs and so on and so forth. And so we also have uh, an automated uh, uh, parsing for outputs, as, and then, you know, we index the past uh, output data so that it is discoverable uh, and shareable with the community and uh, so here is just you know a search uh, for the catalog data available you know the search can uh, happen on various you know metadata 
uh, that is extracted from the outputs. I mean, most of these you know, are very application specific, uh, domain specific, uh, in this case, chemistry. And this metadata is also uh, available uh, in, in the web browser. And, you know, you can either make this data public or private. So if, if this the, that particular data has been made public, that's why this make private uh, you know, button appears here. Otherwise, you can simply upload the data to uh, a third party uh, sharing service like Fixshare. And it's just acknowledgement. So I'll stop here and take any questions. Uh, thanks, Sudhakar. We do actually have um, a couple questions. Um, one came from Jack Smith uh, asking if he says, can Seagrid be locally hosted, say, within a Hub Zero hub, or does it require SIGAP? Um, and if you can okay. stop sharing your screen, I'll put up um, a, a final screen with a link for evaluation, too. OK, I'm trying to locate where my stop share. OK, here it is. Great, okay, thanks. Uh, Seagrid, uh, uh, so the web browser or desktop portals are available to be deployed anywhere. I mean, there are two ways of deploying, you know, Airavata based gateways. Uh, one is uh, called what is called a hosted uh, uh, fashion. The other is, I mean, uh, they can be host, uh, hosted locally. Uh, the the hosted gateway is you know what we call what he was referring to as a SIGAP hosting, uh, which are hosted at uh, Indiana University. Uh, so the, I mean the hosting is very nice because it uh, removes all the headaches of hosting this big multi-tenanted Apache Airavata infrastructure locally, and uh, so that way you know, we will bear the responsibility uh, automatically, all the updates to the Apache Airavata will automatically be inherited by the, the hosting services and so on and so forth. But the uh, the gateway itself could be controlled by the admins locally and all the resources that are associated with the gateway uh, can be controlled by the, the admins locally. So we have deployed some of these uh, kinds of gateways on campuses. Uh, and we are actively uh, we're actually in the process of actively deploying uh, even the uh, uh, the desktop application for some campuses uh, all the software is uh, you know in the in the github uh, under apache license so people can take it and customize it uh, just uh, one one thing that i just wanted to say is that they, we are now moving towards uh, an implementation uh, in Django, which is a Python implementation for the Apache Airavata. Uh, the current implementation is in uh, uh, is using PHP. So Apache Airavata itself has uh, you know uh, SDKs for many uh, many languages, you know Java, which is what we use for the desktop application, uh, PHP, which is the current uh, thing, and then uh, the Django, you know, the Python. Uh, in the near future, actually, there are some Python clients. For example, Chem Compute that uh, you know Catherine just put up uh, uses uh, a Django-based uh, uh, interface to Apache Airavata on the back end. And Mark will probably talk about it next week or in the coming sessions. <laughs> That's Mark Perry, not <laughs> Mark. No, Mark current. Perry, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, thanks, Sudakar. Um, Sudakar. Um, uh, we had one other question, um, and I know that we're that we're a little bit past the top of the hour, so we'll stay on for a minute longer just for um, to, for you to answer that question if you can. Um, uh, there, the question was uh, from Mona, who asked, "I'm curious why Seagrid did both web and desktop versions." Uh, uh, so initially, uh, the computational chemistry grid we uh, exclusively did uh, a, a desktop version. Because we are integrating a lot of uh, uh, native uh, interfaces, uh, some of which I showed in, in terms of these molecular editors and uh, graphical uh, editors for application inputs, and also integrated third-party uh, post-processing tools. Uh, you know, for example, including for Abacus, we uh, you know, enabled the CAE uh, tools. Uh, for chemistry, we uh, enabled you know VMD. Uh, and uh, mold and uh, you know, many third-party uh, analysis tools. 
uh, and then we were uh, so that way the, the interaction with uh, with the gateway was you know a lot more uh, i would say you know user uh, friendly uh, but now I think the the web browser based tools have become quite sophisticated, and we are now moving towards uh, providing the web browser based functionality as well. So that's partly historical and partly functional. Great, uh, thanks. 